Okay, Idaho Falls, can you hear me? Yep, yes. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Engineering 120, and for the next, I guess, two weeks, you get the computer science section of the course. I am in the right classroom, right? Okay. Uh, then uh, we had a little network problem this morning, so what I'm going to show you here is uh, a little bit out of date. I'll repost the one in a moment. Uh, the only thing that's really going to affect you is I mentioned things that are due Thursday, and we meet on Monday, Wednesday, so things will be due on Wednesday. Uh, otherwise, it's pretty much the same. Uh, the computer science department has changed a little bit. Uh, this is a little bit out of date, but we're a small department. We're normally four computer science faculty. We actually have six now or seven, or I don't know how you want to count it these days. But really, there are four of us who run the computer science program. So what the two of us are going to talk about, Dr. Bosworth and I, I'm Dan Tappan, for the next two weeks are various aspects of how computer science and engineering fit together. Are there any computer science students in here? Okay, yeah, well, you don't have to take this class anyway. It's not required for our major. Occasionally, we do have students in here. So I assume the rest of you are from the other majors, the uh, electricals and civils and so on. How many uh, electricals, first of all, hands? No electricals. Okay, how about civils? All righty, and mechanicals? Okay, and nuclears? Oh, a lot of nuclears. Okay, so I guess somehow electrical didn't get represented this time. Okay, what I'm going to talk about today is our program, first of all, what the computer science program is. Uh, the intent here, of course, ideally would be to get you to jump ship and come over to us. We'd love to have you. But more realistically, it's to show you how a minor in computer science or even any skills in it by taking some of our classes can really help you in your disciplines. Because we're not just computer science, electrical engineering, and whatever else just separated. Everybody works together and it's a very multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary career. And computers play a role in all of this. So the more you know about computers, the more you can actually do in what you, you're studying and what you're going to do in your career. So we're going to look a little bit about our program here. These are things that we actually teach, not just things that are related to computer science. And I'll go through these in a little detail here in a moment, the areas of emphasis. And then look at what it takes to get a major and in particular what it takes for you to get a minor for some of you, it's actually not much at all. The electricals, for example, which we don't apparently have, only have to take two extra classes. So it's, it's very little extra work, and you can get that on your transcripts, and that actually shows up when you go out to get a job that you have a minor in computer science. Now, the project we'll be talking about is actually due Wednesday. It says Thursday up there. Sorry, I'll get that corrected. So there's no real order to this, but I'm going to go through things that we teach and that are pretty representative of what computer science is. Uh, one of the things that you see all the time, whether you realize it or not, is computer graphics. It's something we use certainly on computers. Uh, I mean, this presentation itself is graphics. It's not the most exciting on the Hollywood level, but Hollywood is definitely grasped onto the, the value of using computers to make exciting things like dinosaurs chew up people or transform or robots or whatever else. Obviously, it's not very easy to make that kind of thing in real life. If you're going to have huge transformers running around, computers can do a great job of that. Uh, and I'm not going through each of these, these points over here, but these are some of the things that are representative of computer graphics. And for each of these slides, it'll be more or less like that. If you have questions, let me know. Uh, feel free to interrupt at any time. So uh, computer graphics, that's kind of where things are going. I mean, we've got this 2D world right now where we've got uh, flat screens, and you look at a screen, you're sort of just staring at something. It won't be very long before everything is 3D or four-dimensional or whatever else you want. Virtual reality immersion where you feel like you're actually in it. And I know you guys are kind of young, but if you think back to the way computers were when you were kids and the way they are now, that's been a, just a, a massive, substantial change in the last 10, 20 years. And we're not done. Think about what's going to be different 20 years from now. I mean, what we have today, which we think is pretty cool, will look pretty lame to your kids 20 years from now. And how's that going to happen? Well, it'll be you guys. You're going out there, you're going to figure out what the next generation of whatever is, and you're going to have fun with it, and then the next generation of us, kids and so on, will, and they'll continue it. Now, one thing that you end up doing in computer science, uh, whether you like it or not, is programming. It's, computer science is not programming, and programming is not computer science. Those are just parts of each other. As a, for a minor, you'll end up taking mainly the programming courses. That is, learning how to write programs, how to solve simple problems, because that's what you'll do in your majors and your careers as well. 
But actually, to be a computer scientist involves a lot of things well beyond that. And we call it software engineering. It's, and more things than just that. But it is truly the engineering process, no different than what you're learning from mechanical or electrical or the other disciplines. We just do it on a software level. And it's just as complicated, just as nasty to work with, but just as much fun. Uh, so some aspects of that, uh, we're, we're looking at real world design, solving real world problems. Some of them can be fun like video games. Some of them can be really important and practical. Uh, flight control systems for airplanes, for example. Life critical things. Uh, some of them can just be to help you do your jobs. We'll see some software that engineers use. It's designed just for engineers, but it makes your life a lot easier. Now, there's nothing exciting to look at up there. It's a bunch of programming and code and so on. That's not the, the neatest side of it compared to the dinosaurs, for sure. Hardware and computer systems. Now, computer programs, operating systems, whatever you want to call it, we, we kind of lump in as programs, run on hardware. Well, where does the hardware come from? That typically is the crossover to the electrical engineering side. And this talk is somewhat related to combining CS and, and double E because those two complement each other extremely well. That is, there's a software side, there's a hardware side. Together, we have computer engineering for the most part. And there are actually degree programs for that. We're working on one in this, in our college ourselves, uh, where you end up pretty much learning both sides of it. So even if you're just a computer science major, it's good to learn some of the electrical side. If you're in electrical, it's good to learn some of the CS side. And the same holds for the rest of you. It's really advantageous when you go out to find a job to be able to say to your employer, I have computer skills. And that doesn't just mean I can use Microsoft Word. It means you can write programs within reason. I mean, you're not expected to be able to, to do incredibly fancy stuff because you're not a computer scientist. But you've got skills that other graduates may not have. And that makes you marketable. So some of the things we see in the, on the electrical side, of course, are all the little circuit boards and everything that show up everywhere. No matter what your discipline is here in engineering, you're going to play with these things, like it or not. And the more you understand about them, the better you'll be able to work with them. So that's the, the actual physical hardware. Over here is just sort of a perspective on how we design the physical hardware. Well, we end up using software for that. We connect all the wires up and chips and whatever, and it doesn't look anything like the real thing over here, but they're actually equivalent. So we learn things. In fact, uh, some of you have to take various courses in understanding how hardware works, how computers operate with their math and do logic and so on. And just about everybody has to learn logic. But we'll look at things that like uh, microprocessors, mic which are in computers, microcontrollers, which are in everything. Absolutely everything. There are literally billions of these things a year going out into the world. Like my little microphone here has a microcontroller in it, which is a little microprocessor, a little computer, kind of like this guy here, that makes it do what it's supposed to do. It really only does one thing, but without it, this mic wouldn't do anything. So just about everything, look at your cell phones, your iPods, your PDAs, whatever it is, all of this is some kind of hardware running some kind of software. And it makes your life easier. Now, scientific computing is what everybody else does. You take the biologists or the weather scientists or whatever else. We've got some tornadoes over here. Everybody else who's doing what you might call science uses computers. They don't know computers. If they do, that's great. But usually they don't. They know their science. If they need computers to do things which are really complicated beyond their skills, they get computer scientists to do that. So we have a very interdisciplinary approach to things where we don't know weather science. I mean, we're not expected to. They don't know computer science. They're really not expected to either. So we have to work together. Just like you have to work together as different disciplines of engineering, you have to work with computer scientists. You also have to work with other scientists and the real world. You have to work with the public that doesn't understand any of this kind of stuff. So we work with lots of different people all the time. And the more you know, the more you're comfortable with, the better that goes. You don't have to be, and you can't be an expert in everything. But the more you know, the better it is. Modeling simulations are a really big thing. Uh, we have problems that are just too large to actually do, or we can't, like tornado research. You know, tornadoes are a, a tremendous expense to this country. Every year they go in and destroy millions and billions of dollars of things, add hurricanes to that. 
We can't build hurricanes. We probably wouldn't want to. But we do want to understand how they work so that we can minimize the effects of their damage or even stop them. So how do we do that? Well, not in real life. You've got to do it in programs, in computers. So we've got fancy software that attempts to model a tornado on supercomputers, huge computers which are designed to solve problems like these. Your average desktop can't do it. It's just not powerful enough. So we've got something like high-performance computing here. The INL spends millions of dollars a year on running high-performance simulations on things like nuclear reactors, warheads, things that we really can't play with either. So this is a huge part, no matter what kind of engineer you are, you're going to work with simulation tools. You'll have to understand how to set the problem up, how to run it, how to interpret the data, and so on. Now on the more public level, non-engineers, non-scientists, it's what everybody else has to work with. You know, your, your standard mom and pop computer with Word and Internet Explorer and all that stuff on there, which are just taken for granted. The fact that any computer, for the most part, can get on the Internet and access anything in the world is just normal today. Five, ten years ago, that wasn't the case. So just think about the next technology, what will be the next neat thing out there that will just supposedly make life even better. We don't know what it is. Somebody's got to invent it. That could be you. Uh, these aren't the most exciting things. I mean, word processors, you know, you don't really get all that excited about using it. But imagine if you didn't have it. Everybody remember typewriters? I mean, you're lucky you don't have to use them anymore. They're dreadful. They were a lot better than the previous tool we had to use, just your hand. I mean, that wasn't a lot of fun either. Uh, so these things, kind of mundane, boring, and so on, but this is how we make progress in the world, and we just take it for granted these days. But it's got to come from somewhere. Uh, along with that, I, I should mention, uh, these are all good things, but if you're interested, you always have to defend yourself against the bad things, because there are, there's always a group of evil people out there trying to undermine what you've done. So security and uh, all sorts of business aspects of making sure that things work correctly and don't get hacked. That's a big part of society these days. We are so dependent on computers, everything in the world is dependent on them, and we really have to be careful that somebody doesn't get a hold of that and misuse it. Artificial intelligence, this is kind of the next generation. It has been for many generations, we keep saying. But the next generation of computer science, the joke is to, to make computers behave the way they do in the movies so that they're smart and do things that are good and sort of human-like. We really don't want Terminator robots. That's not the intent. That's not a good thing. Uh, but Hollywood has been way ahead of us. They've made computers do things that we would really like them to do, minus the Terminator side of it, to take care of some of the things that we as humans don't like to do. You know, we always talked about robots cleaning your house and taking out the trash and so on. Someday that'll be a reality. A lot of things that computers do today for us aren't intelligent, but they do free up time for us to do other things, like word processors and email and other things. So what we're trying to do is transition into a world where computers can actually help us do our jobs better in a more intelligent fashion. And that's called artificial intelligence, trying to get machines to understand human language. That's one of the huge bottlenecks in computers still, that they're really powerful, but they're not very easy to use. They, they look prettier. They've got interfaces, and you've got a mouse, and so on. But really, when it comes down to trying to communicate with them, we don't communicate with machines the way we communicate with each other. And clearly, we're very good at communicating with each other, because we can talk, and we can understand. But when you try to tell a computer something, it doesn't understand. So ideally, at some point, we'd like to be able to do a Star Trek thing and say, hey, computer, this is my problem. Go solve it. And it would say, sure. Or it would at least help us. Uh, this also comes into the world of entertainment and computer games and so on. There's a, a huge market out there for machines that behave more the way we do. So what I've shot through here are some of the highlights of our computer science program. Certainly not all of computer science. We, we have a small program. We don't, can't teach everything. These are required courses. These are things that we, faculty have interests in. And you can actually take any of these for the most part. 
Uh, but I want to show you a little bit about what it takes to get a degree, a major, or a minor in our program. Uh, the major is not all that different from what you're studying here. It's a, supposedly a four-year degree. Nobody finishes in four years, just the way things are. It's not anything to do with our program or yours. It's just a lot. So it's about uh, 130 credits or so. A lot of the courses are very similar to yours or exactly the same courses, like the math, the science, and so on. Uh, we've got... Uh, some of your, well, I, sometimes we call them CS, but double E courses in here that overlap. They're the exact same courses that the double E's take. For a major, it's, well, the basics of computer science. Software engineering, some hardware, data structures, figuring out how you make programs that do things practi that are practical. Uh, that's a, actually a year-long course. Database things, uh, programming languages, microprocessors, lots of different aspects to what computers are and can do. For the most part, you're just filling in the blanks the way you do in your own program. So if you're mechanical, you'll see machine design and uh, mechanical drawing and analysis and synthesis and all sorts of different aspects of mechanical systems. We just do it with virtual computer systems. For the minor, it's just the fi first five courses. And four of those are actually programming courses. One of them is a math class. This 187 is a math class. And some of you have to take it anyway. Uh, two intro programming classes, which a lot of the programs here already have to take, at least the first one. And then two after that. So, and these are offered, this would take you two years. Uh, these two up here are offered every semester. These two are offered only in the fall and spring, once, once a year. But adding on to your program, you, in two years you can have a minor. If some of these courses you already have to take, you can do it practically in one year. So six or nine extra credits. And again, it's, it really makes you marketable. Any questions so far? So what I talked about a moment ago was computer science isolated. That is, that's what CSs do. Now we're going to talk about what you can do with the CS minor. Why, I've said it's a great thing to have, but why? So I'm going to go through all of the four disciplines here, your engineering disciplines, and connect it up to computer science and show you a little bit about what you can do with it and why I think it's exciting and why I think you should try minor. Uh, very collaborative. Electrical engineering is allied most closely with computer science. It's just absolutely those two are wedded to each other, just different sides of, this, of the coin. Uh, computer engineering, as I said, is really kind of the combination of the two. Hardware design, networks, all these things that no matter what you're doing, this stuff is present. So if you're building a bridge, we don't build plain old welded steel bridges anymore. We build, or we hope to build, what we call smart bridges. The kind of bridges that can tell you, I'm having a bad day. I think I'm getting a little weak over here. I think I'm getting a little rusty. You better come out and work on me because I'm going to fall apart at some point. Right now, when a bridge falls apart, it's usually a big surprise. And it's a big, nasty surprise. If you recall what happened in Minneapolis a couple of years ago, a massive bridge, a main interstate bridge, just plop, with no warning at all, fell down. Not only did it kill some people, but it blocked an interstate for quite a long time. And nobody saw that coming. So that's a purely mechanical or a civil problem, you could say. But more and more, we're adding the hardware and the software side to it to make these anything smart. It's kind of a buzzword but it's actually quite realistic that no matter what you do, you throw smart on the front of it, and what that means is you're making it better at what it does. How you're making it better at what it does is through hardware and software. How you, as a mechanical or a civil, would know how to make a bridge better is by understanding what CSs and double E's can do for you. Oh, some things that we definitely have to rework in this country and the world, well, power generation for one thing, but power transmission kind of that mundane thing that no one really pays attention to, but somehow the power has to get transmitted around the country. And our system's in really bad shape. And as we demand more and more from it, it's not able to do as much as we want. And then we have these nasty blackouts and brownouts and things that we don't like. Industrial control. I'm just picking off a few here, but if you work in a factory environment, everything is computer controlled. Your assembly line, your production, your processes, People still do things, robots do some of it, but the overall 
process of how the business operates is definitely dependent on computers and hardware. And you really need to understand how to do that. Uh, entertainment, that falls into every category. Entertainment is a billion, multi-billion dollar business. I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars a year go into entertainment. So we all like to be entertained. You can make, have, have a great career with that too. Over here, it's just a, a little software tool, kind of a double E sort of thing that we don't necessarily do our circuitry, design our circuits on circuit boards anymore. Not for a while, at least. That is, it's easier to do it in a computer, to see what it does, to tweak it, play with it, hack it, whatever. Quick and easy, cheap, can't really burn anything up, you can't hurt yourself. And once you're satisfied that whatever you've designed here in the program works, you can go over to the hardware world and actually do it for real. But this is how we tend to do things now in the classroom. It's just much cheaper and faster and easier. And you learn more. When you play with real hardware, it's really frustrating, no matter what your hardware is. Because the real world isn't as clean as the computer world, and we can do a lot more a lot faster in a computer. Now we've got a lot of mechanicals in here. Uh, Again, a huge connection here between CS and mechanical. In fact, if you, you look at our master's programs, one of them, measurement and control engineering, is computer science, well, mechanical first, then electrical and computer science combined again. Because we've got mechanical systems, no matter what they are, your car or the projector here or anything, are again connected to electrical things that have to work right. How do we get them to work right and keep working right? It's the computer side of things. We've got design tools, just like on the electrical side a moment ago I talked about creating circuits. Let's throw it against, together something over here, like a, a gas turbine. Big, expensive, not something you can just go in there and say, we're going to hack it together and see how it works. You want to really design this before you commit to building even a prototype so that you have a, an idea of how, of how well it's going to work. And in real life, in the past, you used to have to actually build it, see how it works, go back and build another one to see if you can do it better and it was very slow and expensive. Now we can do that in programs where we can refine this dozens or hundreds of times before we ever build a part. So that when we build that part, it might be the final version, ready to go. Again, back to the uh, tornadoes and the double E stuff, modeling and simulation. That's what you're doing. You are designing something mechanical, seeing how well it works, optimizing it, making it safe, whatever you have to do, before you ever have to build it. And this shows up back to the assembly line process, the commercial industry, all sorts of things, aerospace, automotive, things that we just take for granted. This is how the, the industry works these days. And if you're afraid of computers, or you don't understand them, or you don't want to use them, well, you're not going to have a very good career in those fields. You don't have to know how to make software like this. But the more you understand about how it works and what it can and cannot do, the better you'll be at what you have to do. Now, civils, you guys build big stuff. Just like with the gas turbine, you just don't build it and find out how it works. Bridges are big and expensive and massive projects. We're asking more and more from our bridges. We want them to be lighter and cheaper and faster to build and you know, high-tech stuff. We've been building bridges for thousands of years, and we know how to do it, that we could continue to do things those ways, but really we'd like to do things better now. This is the 21st century, you know. Uh, so all the stuff we do already, just kind of, again, mundane stuff, our stuff is wearing out. Our current infrastructure, all of these structures around the country, is in bad shape. Things are wearing out. We've got to keep those things alive until they can be replaced. We'd like to know when they're going to collapse or fail. And we'd like to replace them with things that are better so that we don't have to be doing this again 50 years down the road. Let's learn from our mistakes and learn from what we've developed in the last 50 or 100 years and make our next generation of everything more efficient. Some of the stuff, boring stuff. You know, roadway design, traffic management. Nobody thinks about that until you're griping in traffic because you're stuck at red lights and it's bumper to bumper. More people, more cars, more demands on the existing infrastructure. No more new land. To put a road in anywhere, not so much in Idaho because we're rural still, still, but in anywhere else in the country where there are already people living there, 
it is tremendously difficult from every perspective, not just from building the road, but from the political side and the environmental side and everything else, we can't just say we need more roads. We need better roads. It's not a quantity thing anymore. It's a quality thing. Pollution, you know, energy production, all these things that are, this is what makes the world go round. So we've got things that we have to make sure we, we continue keeping them alive because they've been there for a while, they will be there for a while, and we have the next generation. Uh, and again, we've got software. Over on the right here, we've got something for some geotechnical whatever. I'm not a civil, but you can't just drop a nuclear power plant somewhere and say, this looks like a good spot. It takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, money, and so on to figure out where do we put these big structures? Where's the best place for a bridge? And not just from the technical side. This is software helping us figure out where is the least politically contentious place to put it? Because we can have a great bridge that never gets built because people don't want it there. And if we can use software and artificial intelligence and so on to try to understand how do we satisfy that side of the problem, we've got a better solution. I mean, everyone says, I like the bridge, it does what it's supposed to do, and I like where it is. If you don't like where it is, it's not doing its job, even if it really is. These things up on the top right, for example, uh, again, I don't really know what it is, but this is the kind of stuff you'll do in your civil classes. I know, I see it. I, I go to your classes, I see what we do in senior design, and you will, even in, as an undergraduate, use lots and lots of tools to do things that used to be tremendously boring on paper. Now, there are calculations in here somewhere. You still have to learn them. Computers won't do your job for you, but just like a calculator, you don't have to do it yourself. If you set the problem up right, it will do the mundane, nasty, little mathy part for you. But you have to know how to set the problem up. We're training you to understand the problems and to use the tools. We had a bunch of nuclears in here. And in fact, even on this side, usually they're on the Idaho Falls side. This is supposed to be the next generation of power. Now, whether you agree with that or not, or you believe it or whatever, that's a different story. But this is not going away. There's going to be more and more demand on the nuclear industry for everything. Nuclear power generation, nuclear weapons, nuclear whatever else we can get out of nuclear, all of that is still dependent on having nuclear engineers who have access to things that, guess what, we can't build. I mean, just like with the gas turbine and the bridges and everything else, you just don't build a reactor and then find out how it works. You've got to think about it. Eventually, you have to build it to use it as a tool and then as a system for generating power or whatever. But this takes decades and billions of dollars of design before anything is ever built to make sure that it's safe and efficient and whatever else is important. And we've got that right up the road here, Idaho National Laboratory. A lot of you, no matter what your discipline is, will end up working there or working for them in some capacity. They have a huge demand for nuclears and electricals and mechanicals and civils and CSs. Guess what we teach here? So the more you know about those, the better. And another thing that's important to say here, even though I'm trying to show you how CS fits into everything, is all of you fit into each other. So make sure you really pay attention when other disciplines are talking. Don't say, oh, he's a mechanical and I'm a civil. I, you know, uh, I'm not listening to you. You don't have to understand it necessarily as an expert, but see what they're saying, because it's just as important to them as to everybody else. You just don't realize it yet. Medical stuff. That's another thing. Our population's growing older, has more demands, we have more medical issues, we have more technology out there that supposedly will make our lives better. A lot of that is definitely nuclear related. It's not power, it's not weapons, it's just health related. And we actually have, as part of the nuclear sciences program on campus, we've got a medical nuclear, I'm not sure exactly what it's called, but it's a medical aspect to physics and nuclear. So if you're interested in that side of things, it's not in the engineering college, but we're related to them and we work together. So do check that out if you're interested. So careers. Uh, I assume that everybody's here because you, you love engineering, even if you don't know what it is. You like to tinker, you like to build stuff, you think it's cool. If you don't, well, you know, I mean, maybe you won't stay. That's up to you. It's not easy, but it is definitely worthwhile. Uh, I do a talk like this for kids around town 
lots of times, you know, grade school, high school, whatever. And I tell them, this has got to be the most fun you can ever have because you get to be a kid your whole life. You get to build stuff, real stuff, big stuff, and it's like being a kid, but you get paid a lot of money and you have a lot of fun. And you can't beat that, I mean, for a career. We're only going to need more engineers. No point are we going to say we've solved all problems so we can just retire engineers. We've got more and more problems to deal with. Guess who solves those? Engineers. So the demands are out there. And computer scientists, which play a role in all of that, are definitely in demand just because of the engineering side and then also for the CS side, just I mean, on its own, if you don't connect it to engineering even. Of course, it also pays well. Now, these numbers are a couple years old. Things have changed as the economy has gone up and down here. But these numbers, no matter how you compare them, are really good. This is entry level. Four years, five years down the road, you walk out the door with an undergraduate education from our degree programs, and you're talking about eh, roughly $50,000 a year. That's the Bachelor of Science here. Now, especially in this area, Idaho, that's a lot of money. Uh, and in, in other areas, uh, you know, you go to Northern California and San Francisco, where the cost of living is higher, these numbers are just astronomically higher. So everywhere, it's a lot more than people make in any other field for the most part. There's doctors, lawyers, engineers, that kind of order. We're way up there. Another thing which is non-tangible here, that is, it's not a numerical thing, but we're highly respected. Doctors are, engineers are, lawyers aren't. You know, for whatever reason, we won't go there, but they make a lot of money, they have a lot of jobs out there, but they're not really respected all that highly. Politicians, lawyers, used car salespeople, you know, that's not really the field you want to go into if you want to be adored. People, the public doesn't understand us. You know, they don't know what we do really, but they think we really do a good job. They think we're smart and they don't necessarily even want to be like us. That's something we've got to get across to them, that we need more and more engineering students because we need this pipeline full. We've got more and more needs. Uh, but it's a lot of fun and it's rewarded. So you can't beat that again. Master's degree, by the way, that's the MS over here. That's usually about a two-year add-on after your bachelor's. And whereas the bachelor's usually takes about eh, four to six years, master's really is two years. Even if you're working, you can probably do that in two, two and a half years. The companies often pay for it, too. And you're boosted way up. I mean, this is two years after you graduate. You're in the 60s. So you can't beat that. And don't use this, by the way, to say, oh, well, I should be a, I don't know, whoever's the highest, up, a nuclear, because they have the highest number. They're all more or less the same. And just because civil down here is a little bit lower doesn't mean anything. After a year, those numbers go way up. This is entry level the day you step out of college. A year or two down the road, poof, it's, it goes flying up. So we've got a task for Wednesday, not Thursday. And we're going to do some engineering in here. Any questions before, because we've just changed our topic here. OK. We're going to design a Mars rover. Now, we've got one day to do it. Actually, we're going to do it in class. So this isn't exactly how NASA operates. You know, they don't say, let's go to the moon tonight. But the plan here is to take the engineering things you're learning in this class and in all your classes and apply them. And I know you're, you're freshmen, or this is considered an intro class at least. So you're not expected to know a lot of stuff. But we're going to talk about the process, kind of speed it up, kind of simplify it, you know, just pretend. But we're going through a design process very similar to what NASA has to do to build a guy like this, these Mars rovers. And uh, so what our project's going to be here is we're, we're going to start at the beginning, what we call the inception, and we're going to brainstorm. Now, I'm giving you the problem. It's a Mars rover. But you're going to brainstorm, this is the homework assignment, and come up with some ideas for what we're going to build Wednesday. Now, we're just going to talk about it. We're going to do it on paper. We're not going to even you know, touch parts or anything. But we're going to pretend to build this, and you're going to contribute stuff because we're going to do this interactively. So I'll show you the framework in a moment for what you're actually going to have to do and be prepared for Wednesday. But we're looking at some kind of explorer robot like these guys out there on Mars. The ones that were designed to last 60 days and are up there going on five years, that's good engineering. As long as you take this seriously, there are no right or wrong answers. 
so don't worry about the brainstorming is not the idea here of getting the things correct and best it is throwing out ideas that we'll play with and some of them we won't touch some of them we'll think are awesome but we can't do we don't know yet we just want ideas this is really fun in engineering be creative that's again it's the fun part this is where you get to say you know if I want spinny rims and, and bling bling on my my robot if you can justify it and you can convince the rest of the design team there you go I don't think you'll get away with it but you can still have fun and as long as you're serious about it that one's a little bit not quite serious enough but who knows what's good or not who knows if somebody's weird ass sorry about that weird ass idea over there in the corner because they're often that way uh, brainstorming idea ends up being the one that's chosen I mean those are the things that everybody says oh boy you know that's just not how we do things nobody's ever gone that way we always do it this way this is the status quo and so on and the guy over here in the corner who comes up with that absolutely bizarre thing nobody's ever thought of is the revolutionary improvement because everything we do everywhere else is evolutionary that is we've kind of done this and then we say we'll build a little bit on it and a little bit on it and so on and occasionally somebody comes up and says I'm completely different and it's, everyone says wow that's cool but they don't say that initially they say that's just really weird we're not going there so what we're planning for on Wednesday is interactive because we're going to discuss stuff and we're going to talk about it not just from a discussion perspective of you know, engineering blah 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 but pros and cons from your perspective that is why we should choose one guy's approach to somebody else's we're quick about it we're not going to spend too much time on it but we're going to actually see the process of discussing things how they win how they eventually end up on the rover it's not just magic and it's not just because somebody says I'm the boss and poof it's going to be that way we're going to do it in real time so we get to see the whole process in about 50 minutes which means we can't do a whole lot but we're still going to get a feel for the process and whatever wins we're gonna see how it fits together and especially we're gonna talk about where the computer science comes into it because I'm going to show you engineering plus computer science so here's what you have to do this is a homework assignment and uh, I'll post these slides I'll show you the link here in a moment so you can get to them you're gonna come up with requirements over here what you want on a rover the theme is the rover it's what you want and we're going to distinguish that at the moment from how we'll get to that in a second so this is what what is the problem before we figure out how to solve it this is engineering methodology you don't just say we're going to start doing stuff you, you really separate it into the who what where when why and how so and I'll show you a table that even explains this further but you're going to come up with three requirements three problems little ones you'll see in a second from your discipline so all of you are in one of the four disciplines uh, if any double majors okay if you're a double major you don't have to do it twice just pick one so whichever one you want to do if you're ME EE just take one stand in that uh, so you've got in your discipline three requirements because you're supposed to know your discipline or understand it the best but you also have to understand what where everybody else is coming from so for everybody else you're going to come up with two that is the other three disciplines so if you're again we'll see an example but if you're a mechanical engineer you'll come up with three that are mechanical and then you'll come up with two electricals and two civils and two two uh, nuclear problems as well and then what that gives you is nine requirements when you do all the math up here now you're going to go back and address how to solve them and no detail here it's not fancy or anything but you're going to think about what I'm supposed to do and now how I'm supposed to figure out a solution to it you don't solve it you just say how you think you're going to solve it and we do the same frame here you've got three for your discipline two for your non-discipline and the table will explain that and this is due Wednesday uh, be prepared come in with it on paper to talk about and then turn in and Idaho Falls you guys will have to, to uh, mail it over I'll explain that next time so here's a table here's an example this is pretty much the actual depth of what I want uh, I mean it's a small table there's not even a full sentence in there don't write that much what we want is there's a column here first of all it's the disciplines in the left column 
middle column is the what, the requirements, and the right column is the how that address the what. Just bullet it. I mean, this is for discussion, so when you throw it out, you'll have a chance to actually talk about it. Don't use these. These are ridiculous. These are intended to be ridiculous because they're a little bit too beyond serious, but they give you an idea of how I want you to set this up. So this is for an ME, mechanical engineering student. So you've got more than the other parts here. So for mechanical, you have to come up with three requirements. So the robot has to defend itself. You don't have to say why. We just, you know, you think this is important. It has to plant grass. It's going to Mars, after all. And it's got to travel in time. You should have a good reason, because if you bring it up, someone's going to ask why. Uh, I don't know why, but that doesn't matter. So we're going across here. So you, you've got the requirements for mechanical. Now let's go back and do it. You're still a mechanical, but you're going to think as an electrical does. But you only have to come up with two. So you'll say, hmm, I wonder what electricals do. Well, you, if you don't know, if you can't even guess, you better research it. If you have a reasonable guess, throw something up that's electrical based. Like it's going to be a, a radio station. It's going to be a hip hop station. Again, I don't know why. Uh, and it's got to be able to download MP3s. You can say those are electrical. There's a lot of crossover in here, too. I mean, nothing is going to be entirely one category or the other, but just try to fit it in. Civils, you guys have to stop lava flows and find chocolate. These are important. And the nuclears make coffee and dispose of waste. So you put whatever, whatever you want in there, but remember, the order is what before how. Figure out what the problem is before you try to address the solution. So once you've come up with these, and you only need that many, so there's your nine, right? Three, five, seven, nine, I said. Then you go back, and we're going to start working on the alternatives, the hows. So these are three up here, solutions to defending yourself. Just a word or two. Uh, you know, shotgun, laser, or chainsaw. You think that these address the problem. You don't have to say how they work and so on yet but they should be something that's related to the problem. So plant grass, you got these. Travel in time, you got those. Remember, you've got three in your area, and then down here in your non-area, you just have to come up with two. So you thought broadcasting hip hop was something double E's do. How would double E's solve that? They might use FM and AM radio. Now, Part two of this, based on what you have learned, or I hope you've learned, or at least gotten out of today, is you're going to look at it from a computer science aspect, which is going to be one more column on that table. Again, this is for not next week, it's for Wednesday. Uh, you're going to use what you saw here, the slides, what you heard from me, and try to figure out how computer science plays a role in this. And that looks like this. So the, the first three columns are identical to what you just saw. Your discipline, your problem, your solution. Then there's a CS role over here. And it, it's probably a little bigger than that. It's not proportional. But try to figure out if you were going to defend yourself with a chainsaw, how computer science might play a role. Now, you don't necessarily know much about computer science. You're not expected to. You, you probably know less about how double E and computer science go together, but use your imagination. Be creative, think about it, and it doesn't have to be correct. I mean, if you think that's correct, that's fine. Uh, let's just throw an example out. Uh, I don't know, defend yourself with a chainsaw. How does a computer play a role in that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, I mean, the chainsaw doesn't run continuously, so you probably want to turn it on and off. When do you turn it on? Or, go ahead. I was just going to say that, that you know, the computers are basically the storing and, and processing of information, and technically, if you swing a chainsaw in any direction or move it, that's information, and so you have to program where it's going to move it, how quickly, mm -hmm. how slowly, and, you know, and, of course, turning it on and off. Yeah, you got to actually target this. You can't just have chainsaws all over the robot running all the time. You know, it just spins around and, and ch chops everything up. You really want to figure out, well, you know, what does it mean to defend yourself? Well, you have to know if it's an enemy. How do you know that? You got to be able to see something. 
how do you actually use that as a defensive mechanism? Well, you've got to put it in the right direction. It's got to threaten and so on. You don't have to write all that over here. Just somehow, in a, a quick blurb, explain how a computer or computer-based system, that is, computers playing a main role in it, would do something. And just enough that I can understand where you're going with it. So it's going to be more than a word or, or two, maybe a sentence. But that's it again. And just one of these for each of these, for each question mark. And use your imagination. If you don't know, well, maybe go try to find out. These are kind of hard to do because they're silly. But the things you'll choose actually are realistic. And how did you know to choose them? Because you have some understanding of them, even if you don't realize it. So again, have fun. Think through this and actually try to figure out what you're learning in the process because this is not going to go to NASA Wednesday afternoon. I promise. I'm not sending your solutions over there and getting any money off of it. What we're getting out of this is the process of solving real problems. And because we only have an hour, we have to pick something that we can do in an hour. We're going to speed up the process, throw out some of the details of it, but you're still going to get the bulk of it. So come prepared Wednesday. This stuff's written. Be prepared to turn it in. It is a homework. And you can find it here on my webpage. It's on, there's an Engineering 120 link off of that. Today's lecture, uh, the, the slides are posted. I don't know about the Moodle side. You, you'll have to check on that yourself. And if you have any questions, let me know. And I will see you in two days. Are there any questions now, by the way? Nope. Okay. Then have fun.